Well, good afternoon. It's a great honor to be here to talk about the current state of the Japanese economy. But uh, as all of you are aware, Japanese economy was hit rather badly by the global financial crisis. Japanese industrial production fell to the level of 1983 by February of 2009, five months after, six months after the Lehman shock. And we had to climb out of that uh, very slowly like everyone else. But the point is that in understanding what's happening to the Japanese economy today, we cannot divorce ourselves from what's happening around the world because the shock we received was actually bigger than the shock some other countries received uh, from the shock starting from the United States and then uh, into Europe. So the first half of my presentation, I like to talk about what's happening around the world because from someone who lived here for the last 27 years, I see huge amounts of similarities between what's happening around the world today and what happened to Japan 20 years ago. And so I like to talk about what's happening around the world from the Japanese experience. And then on the second part, I like to talk about what's happening uh, in Japan that are specific to, to the Japanese economy. Whenever I start a presentation like this and say, say that maybe Europe and the United States have something to learn from the Japanese experience, I get a lot of nasty faces from Americans, some Europeans, who would argue that, come on, Japan did everything wrong. We're going to do everything right. We're going to clean up our act. We're going to clean up non-performing loan problems. And it's not going to be like 15 years uh, muddling through. Well, when you listen to all the debate around the world, whether uh, there should be more fiscal stimulus or less fiscal stimulus, more monetary uh, stimulus, quantitative easing, maintaining zero interest rates, or they should be headed towards some, ex some sort of exit strategy. Should there be more capital in injection to the banks or less? Uh, all of those arguments, problem with rating agencies, all of those arguments we heard in Japan 15 years ago. Every one of them. And so for those of us who lived through this experience in the last 20 years here, it is like a replay of what happened to us. Slightly different set of characters, slightly different timing perhaps, but basically the same story. And that story is that this is a very different disease. It's not something we learn in universities at all. It's a very different type of recession altogether. And so I usually start with this chart, which shows what happened to Japanese house prices 15 years earlier compared to what happened to U.S. house prices during this time around. And if you can look at this chart, the heavy line is the Case-Shiller Index of the U.S. house prices, and the two thin lines are what happened to Japanese well, Tokyo area and Osaka area house prices uh, exactly 15 years earlier. And as you can see, both on the way up and on the way down, both the magnitude and the duration are very, very similar. In fact, uh, this chart was put on the web by someone in Washington uh, March of two years ago. And by October of, uh, October of two years ago, I was speaking in Boston and some real estate investor from, from uh, Boston area came up to me and said, do you know why American house prices begin to stabilize around here? It's because so many people in the U.S. have seen this chart and said, wow, Japanese house prices stabilized. It's okay to buy. Well, I think he was giving me too much credit for, for this chart, but you must agree that the two are moving remarkably close. And most Americans, when they see this chart, usually shut up and listen. Well, after this bursting of the bubble, central banks all around the world drop rates very sharply. In the case of Federal Reserve, where I used to work, the rates were lowered from 5.25 to the Japanese level at the fastest rate in Federal Reserve's history. And all the other central banks dropped rates as well to the lowest levels in their histories. But the recovery of the economies all around the world, especially on, em on employment, 
have been very pathetic, very slow in my view. This is the U.S. industrial production and U.S. unemployment rate. Yes, the industrial production did recover now at the level of 2005, but if you look at unemployment part, it's still nearly double digit, 9.4%. And this is Europe, same story. Industrial production did recover to the level of 2005, but unemployment rate still double digit. When you realize that interest rates are the lowest in Europe, lowest in the United States, the fact that employment is still at these levels suggests that something is awfully different this time around compared to uh, what, what we learn in schools. I mean, if you re- bring the rates down, these economies are supposed to respond, but not on the employment side. And for Europe, even that chart is somewhat misleading because Germans are doing very well with industrial production back to the level of 2006. But when you look at the other, other three, ah, sorry, Italy somehow <laughs> dropped out on, on this, but uh, the dotted green line is Italy. But for Italy, Spain, and France, industrial production is still at the level of 1990s, a level of 15 years ago. And finally, Japan, as I indicated to you earlier, industrial production fell to the level of 1983. Uh, We are recovered to the level of uh, 2002. And yes, employment side has some improvement as well, but still at a very low level. Now, why did Japan get hit, hit so badly when we are not the epicenter of this episode? Well, it's all in this chart, and that is that If you look at the pattern of consumption around the world, it's the durable, a purchase of durables that dropped dramatically all around the world, not just in the United States, but in Japan, in Europe. And this is the pattern of consumption in the United States. And when you look at the services expenditures, it hardly fell. So if you're a country just producing services, you know, just just a slight slowdown, nothing to write home about. Uh, non-durables, just a little bit more, but not much. But if you're in the durable side, you experience a huge drop. And as all of you are aware, the Japanese economy has concentrated itself in producing good durables, all the parts to, necessary to make those durable goods, or the machinery to make those durable goods. So we were hit directly by this decline, and that's why Japan's industrial production fell to the level of 1983. But oh, finally, uh, there's some recovery, and as you saw earlier, even Japanese industrial production is recovering. But why are these economies responding so poorly to monetary signals? Z- near zero interest rates, massive quantitative easing, and still we see unemployment not responding in the United States or in Europe. Well, for monetary policy to work, and I, I used to work at the Federal Reserve's Uh, So I I think I know something about the monetary policy. For monetary policy to work, there has to be people out there in the private sector who respond to monetary signals, mainly the lenders and the borrowers, and particularly the borrowers, because if they don't come in to borrow money, even with low interest rates, then nothing is going to happen. And this is a chart taken from Federal Reserve study of... uh, survey of American bankers, where the bankers were asked, compared to three months ago, are Americans trying to borrow money or trying to pay back debt, compared to three months ago? And because the way it is asked, compared to three months ago, if the entry is below zero, that means more people are trying to pay down debt instead of uh, coming to borrow money. And as you can see, as soon as the housing bubble burst, number has been in a negative range, very sharply into negative, And this circled area is when interest rates were zero. And as you can see, even with zero interest rates, people were trying to pay down debt. And we never learned this in universities, you know, that the companies should be paying down debt with zero interest rates. Same pattern in Europe. Uh, ECB asked uh, its bankers what's been happening to demand for funds from uh, companies. And as you can see, it went to zero. In the case of Europe, it finally returned to zero. Return to zero means demand for funds in Europe stopped falling. But the level of demand, I would argue, is still very far below 
uh, where it used to be uh, before the bursting of the bubble. So if people are actually paying down debt, not increasing their borrowings, even with zero interest rates, there is no reason for monetary policy to work. And that's the world we were in Japan for the last 20 years. This shows what's been happening to demand for funds from Japanese companies, uh, how much money Japanese companies procured from both the banking si system and from the capital market. And during the bubble days, as you can see, there was a huge demand for funds, increasing demand for funds, as people thought they are going to make tons of money investing in all sorts of assets. And because the economy was booming, Bank of Japan was raising short-term interest rates all the way to 8%, tried to cool, cool the bubble down. Then the bubble burst in 1990, 1991, and demand for funds starts falling very sharply. Bank of Japan, realizing that the economy is weakening, dropped rates down almost to zero by 1995, from 8% to zero. And guess what happens afterwards? From 1995 to 2005, full 10 years with zero interest rates, Japanese companies were paying down debt. The fact that this entry is negative means the corporate sector as a whole has been paying down debt. And you wonder why. Why should some, something like this should happen? Because we never learned this in universities, right? Companies are not supposed to pay down debt with zero interest rates. Well, the reason for this is very simple. Those assets people bought during the bubble days, they collapsed in value. So asset prices collapsed, but all those borrowings they incurred to purchase those assets are still on the books. So the liabilities are there, asset prices collapsed, and their balance sheets are all underwater. They're, many of them are technically bankrupt, or completely bankrupt. Now, if you're bankrupt, that's the end of the story, but there are actually two types of bankruptcies. If your main line of business is still good, but because you made these silly investments in the late 80s, your balance is underwater and you're bankrupt. That's one case. And then your main line of business, selling cars on cameras, are really shot to pieces. You have no cash flow, and then you're bankrupt. In the second case, you're really finished. You have no cash flow to do anything. So you have to uh, basically leave the scene. But in the former case, where your main line of business is still doing well, you're still selling cameras, you're still selling cars, consumers all around the world still wants to buy your products, but your balance sheet is underwater because of the silly, silly investment you made during the bubble days, then what is the right thing to do? You have a cash flow, that balance sheet is underwater. The right thing to do under those circumstances is to use the cash flow to pay down debt because that way shareholders won't have to be told that your shares are not a piece of paper now. Bankers don't have to be told that it's all non-performing loans, and the workers won't have to be told that it's all, you have no more jobs tomorrow. So for all the stakeholders involved, the right thing to do is to use the cash flow to pay down debt. Well, that's the right thing to do at the micro level. But when everybody does it all at the same time, what happens to the macroeconomy? Well, <clears throat> when you think about the national economy, if there's someone paying down debt or saving money, which is the same thing, you better have someone on the other side borrowing and spending money to keep the economy going. So in the usual world, suppose I'm a member of the household sector, and if I, let's say I have $1,000 of income, I spend 900 myself, which is already someone else's income, and the $100 that we decide to save will go through the financial system, people like Nobura, Morgan Stanley, and they will take this money to someone else who can use it, that person borrows and spends it, 900 plus 100 against the original income, the $1,000, and the economy moves forward, right? And when there's too many borrowers, what happens? Rates are raised, some of those borrowers drop out, and the, the rest is all borrowed and spent. If too few borrowers, you bring interest rates down, and someone will raise hands, I like to borrow that money to, to invest in something, and the economy moves forward. That's the usual world. But how about this world? With zero interest rates, companies paying down debt. Then if I have $1,000 of income, I spend 900 myself. 900 is not a problem because this is already someone else's income. But the $100 that I decide to save will get stuck in the financial system because there are no borrowers even with zero interest rates. Everybody's paying down debt instead. So $100 gets stuck in the banking system. Only $900 are spent. 
that nine hundred dollar is someone else's income. That person gets this income and says, "Okay, let's save ten percent." So that person spends eight hundred ten, ninety dollars <throat> go into the banking system. It gets stuck because this lasts for ten years. So in this type of world, where people are minimizing debt instead of maximizing profits. Economy could shrink from 1,000, 900, 810, 730 very, very quickly, even with zero interest rates. And you may ask, did anything like this ever happen before? Well, when you go back and look at what happened during Great Depression in the United States from 1929 to 1933, that's the exact pattern. Everybody was paying down debt. No one was borrowing money. And the economy just shrink from 1,900, 810, 730. United States lost 46% of its GDP in just four years because of this process. And we were almost there. On some of these bigger years, corporate debt repayment was over 6% of Japan's GDP, over 30 trillion yen per year. And that's just corporate debt repayment. On top of this, we have households saving money. And as many of you are aware, Japanese households love to save money. So that was 4% of GDP, and this is 6% of GDP. Japan could have lost 10% of GDP every year. That would have been really the Great Depression scenario. But then you look at what happened to Japan during this period. This shows what happened to Japanese GDP, both in real and nominal terms, uh, before and after the bubble. And this purple line is what happened to Japanese commercial real estate. As those of you are old enough to remember, Japanese bubble was led by commercial real estate, and housing prices followed. That's the reverse of the U.S. order. In the U.S. case, housing prices uh, led the way, commercial real estate followed. Now, when the commercial real estate prices were skyrocketing, people fell rich, spent tons of money, so GDP also went up very sharply. That one, anyone can explain. It's, that's no no-brainer. But what's remarkable about the Japanese experience is what happened afterwards. The bubble burst 1990, and commercial real estate prices fell 87% from the peak nationwide. It's not just you know, this, this area of Tokyo that fell 87%. It fell all around Japan, whether it's Sapporo, Fukuoka, Kyoto, down 87%. Now just try to imagine what the U.S. economy will look like when San Francisco is down 87%, Manhattan is down 87%, Atlanta down 87 Chicago down 87 or in the U.K. economy with Edinburgh down 87 London down 87 Manchester down 87 Birmingham down 87. What kind of economy do you think you have left in the UK? Then you look at the Japanese GDP during this period. It never fell below the peak of the bubble. It was always above the peak of the bubble the entire 20-year period. And this is with massive deleveraging going on at the private sector, over 30 trillion yen just on debt repayment. Asset prices down 87% from the peak, the amount of wealth Japanese lost as a result of what happened to both the asset land prices and, and stock market, those two assets alone, not including the Ferraris and Porsches that people bought during the bubble days, all the fantastic paintings that they collected from abroad, just on those two assets, shares and land, was over 1,500 trillion yen, three years' worth of Japan's GDP, three times bigger than the amount of wealth Americans lost during the Great Depression as a percentage of GDP. And then you look at this Japanese GDP not falling below the peak. I think that's the most remarkable part of the Japanese experience, which Europeans and Americans can, can make good use of. How did this happen? How did Japan manage to keep its GDP from falling in spite of what happened to its asset prices and to the private sector deleveraging? Well, the answer is very simple. The government borrowed $100 and spent it. Then it's $900 plus $100, the government. It's $9,000 against the original income of $1,000. There's no reason for GDP to fall. Next year, the same thing happens. Households are saving money. Companies are paying down debt. Why the same thing happens year after year after year? Well, if asset prices fall 87%, one or two years of debt repayment is not enough. It may take five years for some companies. Others may take 10 years. If you're unlucky enough to have bought at the peak, it may take 20 years before your balance sheet is repaired. But as long as you have cash flow, you continue to uh, uh, use those to pay down debt. 
And throughout this period, because Japan was run by, uh, in those days, uh, liberal Democrats, highly liberal with public spending. So as soon as the economy began to weaken, they say, hey, let's be a roads and bridges, thinking that that will act as a pump primer to get the economy going. But pump priming never worked because private sector was paying down debt. They were minimizing uh, debt instead of maximizing profits. So year after year after year, Japanese uh, government increased spending, even though tax revenue was falling. And if you look at the area between these two lines from uh, 1990 to 2005, 2005 is when corporate debt repayment stops. It's over 460 trillion yen, 92% of Japan's GDP. That's a lot of money. And that's how uh, public debt in this country reached such high levels. But I would argue that this is a money very well spent. And you may wonder, gee, bridges to nowhere, uh, roads to nowhere, how can I argue that this, this money was well spent? Well, from the macroeconomic perspective, we have to look at what might have happened in the absence of that government action. And chances are high that with asset prices falling 87% and everybody deleveraging, chances are high that Japanese GDP would have collapsed. Could have collapsed whereby basement two by now. But let's assume in an optimistic scenario that GDP returned to the level of 1985. I say 1985 because people argue that bubble started around 1986. <laughs> So GDP returning to the level before the bubble, then the line will look like this, this dotted red line. And if you measure this GDP against the actual GDP over a 15-year period, it adds up to over, the, the difference between the two GDP numbers on this optimistic scenario is over 2,000 trillion. So basically, Japan bought 2,000 trillion GDP with expenditure of 460. That's a pretty good deal. What Japanese proved in this experiment is that for the first time in history, it was proven that if you put in the fiscal policy correctly from the very beginning, you can maintain a GDP no matter what happens to asset prices. That's what this experience or experiment proved that it is possible to keep the GDP from falling. And by keeping the GDP from falling, you give income to the private sector, who will then use that to pay down debt, which, as you saw, you know, that's what they were doing. And <clears throat> after 15 years, their repayment stopped. Uh, balance sheets were repaired. Japanese private sector today has probably the cleanest balance sheets in the world. Of course, then it's the turn for the government to cut uh, and to repair its balance sheets. But the point is that when you are faced with this kind of shock, where a uh, debt finance bubble bursts, economy collapses because everybody's paying down debt, the right thing to do is to put in a fiscal stimulus for the government to borrow the $100 and put that back into the income stream. And this lesson, I'm happy to tell you, was learned by G20 in November 2008. Remember November 2008, after two, two months after the uh, Lehman shock, President George Bush <coughs> convened this emergency G20 meeting in Washington. And in that meeting, <coughs> Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Aso of Japan used this very chart to convince the other 18 members of G20 that, look, we experienced 87% decline, but with the proper fiscal stimulus, we were able to keep the GDP going. Now, the world economy hasn't experienced anything like 87% decline at least not in November 2008. So I also argue that if all of us put in the fiscal stimulus, we should be able to arrest this decline. And everybody agreed to it, also in the communique, and everybody put in the fiscal stimulus, and the world economy stabilized. So the first part of this lesson was learned. Unfortunately, there's a second part, which I'm afraid Mr. Aso in those days probably did not have the time to talk about. And that is that once you are in this type of recession, government uh, fiscal stimulus will have to be maintained for the entire period of private sector deleveraging. Because if the private sector is still deleveraging and government pulls the plug, the whole thing will come crashing down right away. And we learned that the hard way 
in Japan on two occasions. There are two bouts of negative growth here, one here and the other one here, 1997 and 2001. How do we get those negative growth? Well, in <coughs> 1997, uh, Prime Minister Hashimoto, against my best advice, listened to the IMF, OECD, those people with this very orthodox uh, thinking, who argue that, well, Japan is have an aging population, you put in all this fiscal stimulus, the economy is still not recovering, you must have wasted money on some of, your, some of the useless projects on Earth, why don't you cut it? And I told the Prime Minister that, no, you don't cut now. If you cut, the whole thing will come crashing down. But I'm just a private sector economist, not even Japanese, right? And all these big shots from Ministry of Finance, OECD, IMF were telling Japan to cut. Uh, Prime Minister listened to, to that camp for obvious reasons. Well, we had five quarters of negative growth, complete meltdown of the banking system. And it took us 10 years to climb out of that hole. This shows what happened to tax receipts, the white, uh, white bars, and the purple bars shows what happened to uh, the budget deficit. And in 1997, or, or 1996, 1997, a Japanese budget deficit was about 22, 23 trillion yen. And they raised taxes, cut spending to reduce this by 15 trillion, 3% of Japan's GDP. Well, what actually happened was the budget deficit increased by 16 trillion. So 68% increase in budget deficit instead of 15% decline. Uh, instead of uh, 16, 60 trillion decline, it actually increased by 68 because the economy collapsed first. Another mild attempt was made by Koizumi, uh, Prime Minister Koizumi in 2001. He tried to limit the issuance of Japanese government bonds to 30 trillion yen, which is 6% of Japan's GDP, trying to limit the budget deficit from growing. Well, that attempt also resulted in weaker economy, negative growth, and tax receipts falling, and budget deficit increasing. In fact, he never met that goal for the entire three years. And even though, as many of you are aware, Mr. Koizumi is a very stubborn person, uh, by 2003, even he realized that things were not going well. He dumped this pledge to maintain fiscal stimulus, uh, uh, maintain gov JG, Japanese government bond issuance at 30 trillion yen. And once the pledge was dumped, fiscal stimulus regained its role as automatic stabilizer, and the economy began to improve, tax receipts began to improve, the budget deficit began uh, declining. But because of these two mistakes, it took Japan 10 years to bring deficits down to somewhere close to where we were back in 1996. And this cumulative, in my view, unnecessary uh, public debt was over 100 trillion yen. So the point is that if you're in this type of recession, you have to maintain sufficient amount of fiscal stimulus to make sure that the money that private sector saved are put back into the income stream by the government. And if you don't do this action, the whole thing will come crashing down. From this perspective, I'm not particularly uh, encouraged by what's happening in Europe these days because in Europe, fiscal consolidation is the only game in town. And there's this Maastricht treaty that says the budget deficit cannot be more than 3% of GDP. And everybody, especially after what happened to Greece, are forced into that uh, budget consolidation mode. But for example, in the case of Ireland, as they are trying to cut the budget deficit as quickly as possible, the economy is weakening. Irish GDP is already 20% down from the peak. And because the economy is weak, tax receipts are falling, the budget deficit not falling, actually increasing. And that's giving uh, even more reasons for concern on the bond market that, gee, these guys are trying to cut budget deficit, the budget deficit is actually increasing. And <clears throat> so the vicious cycle, basically Ireland is in this situation here, that yes, they try to cut the budget deficit, but the situation is just getting worse and worse and worse. And that's, that's what happens during a balance sheet recession. And so what I like to see is that Europeans understand what happens when you're in the balance sheet recession,
and make appropriate adjustments to their policies. This chart shows what's been happening to budget deficit of many European countries together with the US, UK, and Japan. That's the red line. This is how much budget deficit increased. And what the blue line shows is that how much private sector savings also increased in those countries. And everyone is just looking at the red line and says, oh my gosh, the Irish deficit is so large, the Spanish deficit is so large. But they are large because the economy is weak. And the economy is weak because everybody is paying down debt. And because every, so many people are paying down debt, the private sector savings av available in these countries are actually larger than the, budget deficit, the increase in budget deficit. So the money is actually available to finance budget deficit in Spain or Ireland or in Italy, Portugal. The money is there. But because fiscal consolidation is the only game in town, no one is looking at this line. Everybody's looking at that line and getting, getting spooked. It's, oh my gosh, there's such a large budget deficit, way over the Maastricht limit. Uh, we are doomed. But once people realize that hey, there's actually so much private sector savings to finance this thing. There's nothing to worry about. Then I think the situation could, could stabilize. And that's basically what happened to Japan. When all these rating agencies who downgraded Japan, you know, Japan was downgraded to the level below Botswana in Africa at one point. Now, I have nothing against Botswana. I, I understand Botswana is a very well-run country. Uh, but Botswana was getting some aid from Japan. And the donor of the aid rated below its recipient, you know, did not go down very well with the Japanese, uh, to put it mildly. But Japanese in investors realized this mechanism, that this is a balance sheet recession. This is a very special type of re uh, recession, and the government is the only borrower left. And if the government is the only borrower left, we should lend the money to the government. Government will keep the GDP going. Economy will then eventually recover with private sector uh, repairing its balance sheets in the meantime. So Japanese investors understood the whole concept, bought the Japanese government bonds, and that's why we were able to maintain very low yield of government bonds in this country and eventually climb out of this balance sheet recession. And if more and more investors in Europe and the United States understand this exact mechanism of balance sheet recession, I think the problem that's affecting those countries will be reduced. And this obsession with fiscal consolidation, if that is put aside for the moment, and if government put in the necessary, necessary fiscal stimulus, I think European economies can uh, recover as well. In the U.S., uh, there's quite a bit of uh, savings. This one, uh, there's some technical problem with the numbers. But my, the fact that U.S. bond yield is still in the 3% range for a country running nearly 10% budget deficit suggests to me that this is probably the, the right way of looking at it. But at least in the United States, a lot of people are coming to understand my concept of balance sheet recession. A lot of people are using that term now. And people like Christine Romer, CEH, uh, former CA chairman, uh, a lot of people have used this term balance sheet recession to warn people that this is no time to cut fiscal stimulus. Uh, uh, fiscal stimulus. And Mr. Bernanke, uh, Fed chairman, whom I had honored to testify together at the uh, Humphrey Hawkins testimony in, uh, for the House Financial Services Committee July 22nd, made it very clear that this is no time to cut fiscal stimulus because he's beginning to understand this mechanism as well. And so, U.S., I'm not too worried because there's enough people in Washington and some in New York as well who are beginning to understand this mechanism. But I'm still very wary about Europe because until today, fiscal consolidation is still the only game in town. Uh, but I'm not all that optimistic that everything will work out fine because it is almost impossible, I don't want to use the term impossible, nearly impossible to maintain fiscal stimulus in a democracy during peacetime. 
And I tried that on Japanese television all these years. And after a while, people start saying, gosh, who wants to listen to Richard Koo? He never says anything new. Anything new. And I was literally banned from appearing in, in, in places like this for 10 years. And bashed and bashed by many who argue that you know, structural reform solves all the problems, you know, that type. Uh, but this is a balance sheet problem. This is not a structural problem. If Japan has a huge structural problem, Japan won't be able to run such a large trade deficit, having such competitive industries. But if it's a balance sheet problem, then you bring rates down to zero, nothing happens. And we need fiscal stimulus to keep the economy going because the government cannot tell the private sector, please don't, don't repair your balance sheets because the private sector has no choice. The private sector must repair its balance sheets. And so the government has to do the opposite of the private sector to keep the GDP going, meaning that government should borrow and spend the excess savings in the private sector. Well, <clears throat> I tried to make that point in Capitol Hill, but you know how many arguments you get in return. Uh, people say, oh, bond market might rebel, a big government is bad government, it's always for spending, monetary policy should be tried further, uh, the aging population, you know, all sorts of arguments, which I would say are good arguments if the private sector is healthy. If the private sector has no balance sheet problems, they're forward-looking, try to maximize profits, by all means, cut the budget deficit. I have nothing against that. But this is in those very rare moments when you have this massive bubble and the bubble bursts and the private sector is no longer healthy they, and the private sector is in need of help, then the government has to do its part, meaning the government has to borrow and spend the excess savings in the private sector to keep the GDP from falling. I was invited by Cambridge University, the one in the UK, to talk about this concept of balance sheet recession. And I was at asked to speak actually at the Keynes Hall where Keynes uh, was delivering his, his uh, talks and there was a big bust of Keynes right next to me. And when I said, you know, it's almost impossible to maintain fiscal stimulus in a democracy during peacetime, someone raised hands and said, do you know what? Keynes said exactly the same thing at the same table, 1940. So <clears throat> the challenge we face is how do we maintain fiscal stimulus in a democracy during peacetime? Because if you are not a democracy, like in China, you don't have this problem. If someone complains, you got him, put him in jail, and that's the end of the story. But in democracy, it's very difficult. I know it's how difficult it is because I went through the whole, whole process during the last 20 years here in, in Japan. And I'm sure people who are arguing for fiscal stimulus in other countries, like Paul Krugman and others in the U.S., are probably feeling the same heat. Uh, and so I'm not saying that even if you understood everything, it's, it's going to happen easily because spending government money is never a popular proposition. Uh, and that's why democracies typically do poorly coming out of balance sheet recessions. Now, that's the world economy. I have to talk something about the Japanese economy. Uh, for Japan, we are facing an exit problem. What is an exit problem from a balance sheet recession? Well, exit problem is that after 15 years of debt repayment, as you saw earlier, Corporate executives in Japan are so sick of borrowing money. They're saying to themselves, never again, never want to be in that kind of situation again. And this trauma toward debt is a very big problem going forward. And this is the same trauma that Americans experienced after the Great Depression. After the Great Depression, those Americans who had to pay down debt during the 1930s never borrowed money until they died. The trauma could get that bad. And even though Japan never experienced 46% decline in income, uh, for a lot of corporate executives, those 15 years were absolute nightmare. They never want to go through anything like that again. 
So they're saying, we never want to be borrowing money. We never want to be uh, captive to, to the financial market. And so even though their balance sheets are completely cleaned, com- uh, completely clean, they still refuse to borrow money, even with interest rates lowest in uh, human history. And bank, Japanese banks are very willing lenders. They still refuse to borrow money. Now, as a result, it is taking very many years to get the Japanese interest rates back up. I mean, we are still at this very low level. No sign of our interest rates recovering to normal level anytime soon. But when you look at the example of the United States, it took U.S. 30 years to bring rates back to the level of 1920s, the average level of rates in 1920s. The average, I mean, 1920s, the rates didn't move up, jumped around a lot, but if you take the average of this period, it turns out to be 4.1%, both for the long end and the short end. And it took the United States until 1959, 30 years after the stock market crash, to bring rates back up to 4.1%. And we are in our 20th year. And so we still have some ways to go. Now, as I said earlier, we never experienced 46% decline in income. And so the trauma should not be that bad compared to the Americans who experienced 46% decline in income and still had to pay down debt. But in a sense, Americans also got help from, nasty thing to say, but Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And that got the U.S. economy going. U.S. was back to full employment by 1943, 44. The economy was doing fine because the massive military spending solved so many of the balance sheet problems of, of individual companies. Well, Japan is in peacetime. There's no war going on. And so, as I said earlier, it's very difficult to maintain fiscal stimulus in a democracy during peacetime. And so we basically... Uh, chuckled along, struggled all, all this time. And, and so I don't know when we will come out of this one. As many of you are aware, Japanese basically are very cautious people. And it's amazing that they actually borrow so much money during the so-called high growth period between 1945 to 19, 1989. But now they're saying never again. And during this period, you notice that one Japanese company was doing very well, coming off new technology that was beating everybody. And that company is Toyota. And as all of you are aware, Toyota has no debt. Toyota was screwed by the bankers very many decades ago, and they made sure that that would never happen again. So Toyota decided not to borrow money. Everything is internally financed. And so during this whole period, when the rest of Japanese companies are going through this balance sheet struggle, Toyota was completely outside the struggle. They were able to put all that uh, cash flow into developing new uh, environmentally friendly uh, cars and, of course, became uh, the largest car manufacturer in the world. So all the other Japanese companies are looking at Toyota and says, gee, we like to be... Toyota had too, which means they're not borrowing money. But if these private sector stores don't borrow money, but households are still saving, saving money, then the government will have to be in there for the whole period. And that, I find, is rather unfortunate because corporate balance is already repaired. And if the government could have to continue to borrow and spend money, because private sector sorts are not borrowing, our budget deficit will continue to increase, then we really face this aging population problem and so forth. So what we need to do is to come up with policies to push these corporate executives to borrow money again. And if they do it once, and if they feel it was okay, since trauma is one of those things that if you get over once, that's not a trauma anymore. And Prime Minister Asso was actually trying to put those policies in place October of 2008. Those of you who followed the Japanese policy debate October 2008, I'm sure you remember that there were talks of massive investment tax credit limited to three-year period. 
if you borrow and invest during those three years, you get this massive investment tax credit. Those were all designed to get corporate executives get over the trauma. And this policy that our President Obama put in recently, that you're allowed to write off everything in the first year, that was also discussed during that period, October 2008. But as I indicated to you earlier, Lehman Brothers collapsed September 2008. And Japanese industrial production fell to the level of 1983. Means, that means excess capacity everywhere in Japan. With so much excess capacity, industrial production down to uh, 25% from the peak, uh, down, uh, not 25%, 25 to the level of 25 years ago. Even if you give them a tax cut, nothing is likely to happen. So the whole talk kind of dissipated, which I, I thought was very unfortunate. But we need some policies to get these guys moving again. Uh, if you, for those of you who are old enough to remember, until around 1970 into 1980s, early 80s, every interest cost in the United States was tax deductible. Whether it's auto loan or consumer loans, credit card loans, they are all tax deductible because Americans were having that problem as well. And I'm sure the American government realized that you have to get these guys to, to borrow money again or else you, you can never get the economy to, to normalize. We may have to consider those measures here as well just to get private sector to borrow a little more. So that's uh, the exit problem which uh, Japan is facing. And if this recession lasts any longer in Europe and United States, I think Europe and United States will face this problem as well, that uh, people will be so averse to borrowing and government will have to do something to get them to, to borrow money again. Now, Japan is still doing very well on, on manufacturing side, you know, these days, a lot of people are kind of passing Japan as, well, the Koreans are doing great, Samsung Electronics, uh, Chinese are doing well, Taiwanese are doing well, Japan, forget it. Uh, this whole, whole country is hollowing. But when you look at the trade statistics, you realize that Japan is actually running a huge trade surplus with Taiwan, huge su trade surplus with Korea, and huge trade surplus with China if you include Hong Kong in it. Given that Japan is suffering from its outrageous exchange rate, that's a pretty amazing feat that this country is still running trade surplus, huge trade surpluses with all three export powerhouses. And that means the products that are exported from China, from Taiwan, from Korea include huge amounts of Japanese components. That's basically what that means. And there was a Wall Street piece. I don't know whether there's a Wall Street uh, Journal uh, person here. I had this study on iPhone. And they found out that the largest component, over 33%, was actually made in Japan. And the fact that Japan is running such large trade surplus with both Taiwan and Korea means that components of, of the iPhone that are coming from Taiwan and Korea also have a large Japanese component. So if you put them all together, yes, they, the iPhone may not say it's made in Japan, but a large component, that, that, and some of the key components are actually coming from this country. And so in terms of industrial strength, this is not like the United States where uh, when Japan tried to take over some of the industries in the U.S., the U.S. just gave up and ended up running massive trade surplus, uh, massive trade deficit w with Japan. Even though Japan is competing with China, uh, Japan hasn't give up, given up yet in the sense that right now, just with the mainland, Japanese trade surplus is almost balanced. And if you add Hong Kong, uh, Japan is running a large trade surplus vis-a-vis -vis China. But in other ways, there are some room for concern. And that is that Japan is chased from behind for the first time in its history.
And because this is the Jap- first time Japan is chased from behind, a lot of people are lost as to what's happening to this country. And to those people, I tell them what happened to the United States in the 1970s. I immigrated from Japan to the United States in 1967. And when I arrived at the shores of San Francisco, uh, I hardly spoke English. Uh, I didn't know what was going on. But Americans are very confident people. Say, you're from Japan? Well, if you work hard, study hard, you could be like us, we'll help you. By 1975, Americans were not very confident people. Because all in so many industries, whether it's household appliances, television, autos, steel, semiconductors, ships, Japanese have taken over. And they thought, gee, we flattened those guys in 1945. If you are beaten by a German company or the French company, maybe Americans could take it. But if you are beaten by a Japanese company, says, gee, something's going awfully wrong. And if you remember the debate in the United States from 1970 all the way to about early part of 1990, where everybody thought Japan was doing everything right, the Americans are doing everything wrong, and some students with no qualification ended up with in Harvard Business Schools or something because they needed Japanese input so desperately. Uh, Japanese management was talked up to be the Bible for the rest of the world, and everybody started eating sushi. Well, that part remained, and that was good, but... Uh, you know, there was massive infatuation with Japan because Japan was coming from behind, overtaken so many of the U.S. industries. Well, we are in that same predicament in that we are chased from behind for the first time and people are lost. Uh, so many industries are hollowing out to, to Southeast Asia, China, and elsewhere, and they don't know what to make of it. So to those people in Japan, I tell them, study what happened in the United States because, and, and Europe for that matter. Uh, and I give an example for exa- uh, of German camera industry. In 1965, how many Germans, or for that matter Japanese, would have thought that Japan's Nikon and Canon would take over the world? 1965, everybody thought Leica, Zeiss Econ, Rolei, those are the top brands. By 1975, German camera production was zero. Just 10 years, things can happen that quickly. And now we in Japan are faced with a similar challenge. China is taking over so many industries. And even though Taiwan and Korea were were kind of chasing Japan in the past, they still were dependent on Japanese inputs for, for their productions. But for China... They got nuclear submarines and space rockets entirely domestically developed and money coming out of their ears with the workers willing to work for a fraction of Japanese wage. Lots of young people, um, very aggressive, very talented, equally hardworking. And that's a huge challenge for Japan in that how, how do we fend off challenges from behind? Some, in some areas, they're doing very well. But overall, I think society is very much uh, losing confidence. And, and so I tell the Japanese that, yes, Americans are where we were in the 1990s. But the Japanese are where the Americans were in the 1970s. And after all that talk in the United States, where the... United States should emulate the Japanese management or not, all sorts of arguments. At the end, I think the conclusion that United States got was that if you want to stay ahead of the competition, you just have to run faster. I mean, protectionism was tried, gentlemen's agreement was tried, all sorts of things are tried. But at the end of the day, I think the lesson was that if you want to maintain your advanced country living standards against these people who are coming from behind, you just have to run faster. Faster means you have to come up with more new products, more new designs, more, diff- more di- colors, fashion, music. We basically need more Michael Jacksons, as it were. Now, in that sense, Western 
our economies because of their emphasis on liberal arts education. People are encouraged to think independently. Those were a huge help in developing talents together with uh, so-called supply-side economics, encouraging uh, or rewarding these people who come up with uh, new ideas and, and take risks. For Japan, that is going to be a challenge because in the Japanese education system, conformity, trying to regurgitate what the professor says, that give you an A paper. But in the U.S. top universities, if you just wrote what the professor said, you might get B or C. You have to add something to it, a new angle, new ideas, then you get an A. So these differences are something that I think Japan must overcome. Now, <clears throat> that then we get into this cultural issue, which I don't want to get, in, get into, but w once Japanese understand that that's what has to be done, then I think the changes will come probably quite quickly. Until the consensus reached, this country moves rather slowly, but once the consensus reached that we have to walk in that direction, I think the changes will come relatively quickly. But at the moment, you know, there are not too many people who are talking this line. And if you listen to the education debate or uh, uh, other similar debates, they're saying, well, we are falling behind because we decided to make Saturday holidays for the school children. So let's put the school children back into uh, school on Saturdays. But we need different kind of talent when you are trying to fend off someone coming from behind. We are trying to chase somebody. You need certain type of talent. But if you are fending someone coming from behind, you need different kind of talent. And forcing children into schools on Saturdays, just like in the old days, is, is no solution in my view for the challenge this country is facing at the moment. And all the confusion, all the debate is basically the same debate United States had in the 1970s. And so if Japan learns from the experience of the United States, then, you know, U.S. took about 20 years to get its act together. Maybe Japan can shorten that adjustment period to, to, to maybe 10 years or something like that. Um, just as if the Americans learn the Japanese experience of the balance sheet recession, then they won't have to take 15 years to, to, to get out of this one. And lastly, I often talk about this point about Japanese housing. You know, people say, well, where can Japanese companies invest, invest money? Well, as many of you are aware, even though Japan has this uh, developed country status, in all areas, one area that it's difficult to call Japan a developed world is the housing condition because houses in this country are still very cramped, small, and not well made. This chart shows how much money Japanese people put in to build their houses and how much those houses are worth today. You know, Japan has this crazy rule. Someone must have come up with this idea many, many decades ago to make sure the Japanese will never become rich. And this formula is that whatever you build on top of the land, the structure, will have no value after 15 years. And because of this crazy depreciation rule, basically treating houses as durable goods instead of capital goods, as in all the other countries, the value of houses on Japan is only here which means after spending this much money to build those houses, we already lost $463 trillion, uh, because of depreciation. Now, in the old days, this didn't really matter very much because the economy was doing so well, the flow of income, the GDP growth, and land prices were skyrocketing. All of those basically offset this decline in uh, value of the structures and still got some change left. So people were not too bothered by it. But the last 20 years, asset prices are falling, and what's on, the top, what's on top of it, the structure is depreciating. And this depreciation is something like 20 trillion yen a year. That's 4% of Japan's GDP. 
So if we don't add 4% to GDP, we actually become poorer and poorer just because of this, this silly depreciation rules. So I have suggested to numerous prime ministers that this is the area we really have to work on going forward. This, uh, the third line, the red line, is how much those houses were worth if they were built and valued as in the United States. And so if those houses are built like in the U.S. and valued like in the U.S., Japanese should have been here instead of here. Now, that, that difference is $730 trillion. It's no peanuts. Uh, so, yes, there is one area where a lot of investments can go if we can only do something about all sorts of this uh, silly rules about sunshine laws and and site to volume limits and so forth, if we can work on those uh, restrictions, there's still, I believe, a lot of demand that, that can be met in this country. Now, I mentioned about this problem over 20 years ago. And many of my research were taken up by the Japanese embassy and were put back into the so-called SII, Structural Impediments Initiative, and some of the key contents of the Structural Impediments Initiative from George Bush Sr. was actually based on my research at Nomura. And so the talk has started from that point, and some changes were made to building codes and so forth, and that's why you see uh, more higher buildings. But I think we can do a lot more, uh, which will be to the benefit of everybody. So that's basically uh, my view of the Japanese economy, and I'm open to take your questions. Thank you.